So today what we'll do is we'll uh, review uh, the entire drug development process. Um, we started with um, talking about process development right in the beginning of the lecture. Dr. Ashutosh had talked about this. I will review some of those aspects of process development. So it becomes clear to you how everything is in one package. Then we had talked about biologics, vaccines, and a little bit about gene therapy, we just introduction to gene therapy. And then we did pharmacology. We looked at how PK, PD, and modeling and all of that is important. We looked at a few case studies, right? Uh, then we looked at toxicology and how safety adverse events are affected. So that's the third, fourth part of the process. Um, and then yesterday we talked about clinical trials and how clinical trials are important and how they might, um, how the FDA sees them, how the advisory committee sees them. So that's the overall picture of these five steps of drug development. That's how drug development takes place. So today is, today is just a review day. We'll talk about various different things today. So let's talk about briefly about process development. So um, when we look at platforms, meaning on what drugs are made, you know about small molecules, these are chemical molecules. I don't talk much about small molecules in this course, but you know, there's lots of uh, small molecules. Rohit, for example, works on small molecules, designing chemistries and making small molecules. Biologic drugs can be peptides, recombinant proteins, monoclonal antibodies, bispecific antibodies, antibody drug conjugates. So these are different kinds of, these are called platforms that you make drugs on. Then you have gene therapies, cell therapies, and gene editing. That these are the platforms on which you make drugs. Okay. So most companies will have one or two platforms that they will develop drugs on. So a small molecule company will make only small molecules generally because the kind of manufacturing facility you need will be very different from the kind of biologic activity, biologic drugs that you have to make where you need fermenters, you need um, purification units, you need formulation, diff very different. So the manufacturing facilities are very different. Um, the BLA, which is the final submission of the uh, of the application, uh, is a biological license application and new drug application. That is a small molecule. is the is called the chemistry manufacturing control section of the BLA. So the entire process development and manufacturing that you do in your drug development process is submitted in what is called module three of the BLA. So it is the third section of, of this submission. And why this is categorized into these modules, module 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, because even in the FDA, if you imagine, when you submit these 2 million pages of the BLA to the, to the FDA, who is reviewing these? Even in the FDA, there is a department of, um, there's a group of people who are specialized in reviewing the manufacturing. So they have engineers, they have process development engineers, they have scientists, they have clinical scientists. Who, can, who are reviewing the manufacturing part of the BLA. The clinical part of the BLA, which is in this case module 5, is being submitted to the FDA and the people who review the clinical part is a very different group of people. So the BLA goes to different sections of the, the FDA, right? Not one person reviews everything. So that's why they are put into these sections. So that's how the BLA works. You've already heard of GMP, good manufacturing practices. These are um, that everything has to be done by law and by the guidances that are provided by the FDA. So you have to have standard operating procedures. You have to have validation reports. You have to have methods that you follow, standardized methods. So all of this is highly regulated, meaning it can, regulated means what? It, the FDA can come and review it. That's what regulation means. It, is, it goes by the law and you can review it. When you go to college and you write in your notebook, it doesn't matter what notebook you're using. Any notebook you can use, right? But in the, in the lab, you cannot use any notebook. You have to use a sequential notebook. And that sequential notebook has to be traceable. You have to know. And when you leave, you have to leave your notebook there. You can't take your notebook with you. It belongs to the, to the institute or it belongs to the... Because any time the FDA will come and ask a question, they will ask, where is the raw data for this? You'll have to be able to show that. So that's all of these practices are called GMP. And good manufacturing practices, there's a training. You can actually go do training for this. And when you work in a company, the first thing that you will get is training to do GMP, GMP work. 
I'll introduce a term called QBD, quality by design. This is a this is actually a FDA term. Um, in this, before you start developing a drug, you have to design the drug first on paper to say, okay, this if, if I'm making insulin, I know that the, this is the amino acid of insulin. I know this is how the insulin will be, in what it will be manufactured. For example, I'm going to express this in E. coli. So this is the gene for e, for um, insulin. All of this has to be systematically written and organized. And in the document that in which you write all of this planning is called the target product profile. That's here in TPP. This is called the target product profile. These are terms that are commonly used. If you go to the industry, people will say, oh, have you, have you got the TPP for this document? And that's the target product profile, which is the description of the requirements of what the drug has to be, right? The second term in this is called critical quality attributes. So these are the factors within insulin, for example, um, which are important. For example, insulin um, is a hexamer. So it has to have six uh, uh, insulin molecules to make, to make it functional. So the fact that six insulins are required is a critical quality attribute of the, of the insulin. The ability of insulin to bind to insulin receptor and activate a signal transduction cascade is a critical quality attribute. The affinity by which the, uh, the insulin will bind to the receptor is a, is a critical quality attribute. So like this, there are many critical quality attributes of a molecule. So you have the target product profile of what you have to do, and then you have the CQA of each one. And then there's something called the, pro, pro, uh, the product design space, so all the various factors that can contribute to manufacturing the insulin. You, have, you design the process design space, the product design space and the process design space. The control strategy, what are the limits of insulin? So if you have the potency of insulin, let's say is by um, potency is five, then your variability is going to be seven to three or whatever that number is. You have to define what that variability is going to be, right? And once you define all of these critical quality attributes to the control strategy, then you have to validate your method or process of how you manufacture insulin and you make multiple batches of insulin and every batch should fall into the category, into the criteria that you have decided. This entire process is called quality by design. So you're, you're ensuring quality by planning everything systematically. This is a term that is used in the field of um, drug development. Yeah? And this is just a diagrammatic representation of that. You have your design space, you have your operating space, and you have your characterization space. Design space is what your drug is going to be. Insulin factors are going to be. Uh, operating space means you give yourself a little bit leeway. Agar kuch ho gaya, it won't fail, but it's going to trend to fail. You should know that space. And then finally, what is your space? How do you define the, the design space? By looking at its all the parameters that can potentially fail. These are these look very arbitrary right now. But once you start diving into your specific molecule, you'll, you'll be able to understand. So this is, this is what, when we are looking at process development, right? Process development of a particular molecule. It should meet the requirement, it should be cost effective, it should be robust, scalable, transferable, compliant, and usually for a novel molecule, it should be innovative. So that you can generate intellectual property for it. Rohit, we were talking yesterday about how many molecules, like repurposing of drugs and you are trying to develop a drug that binds to the insulin receptor. It could be insulin, but it could be anything else. It could be anything that binds to the insulin receptor, can be a replacement for insulin, for example, right? So generally what you do is you have hundreds of molecules that you're going to screen, and you find which ones are going to bind to insulin, and then you find the best, and, that, and then through those best, you characterize them further and further, and finally choose one molecule that will be the most optimal uh, process. This whole process is called the molecule assessment process. And these are terms that I'm just saying, you may not remember all of them, but you know, when you when you are actually working in the industry, these, oh, I'd heard QBD once. That's not the first time you've heard it, right? So then you then you start becoming familiar with these words. Uh, I told you about target product profile, molecule assessment, platform process. Platform is, um, so I've got a process to make insulin, for example, with in expression E. coli. So I have E. coli, I have the gene for insulin, I have a fermenter, I have a purification unit, and I have a formulation unit, right? Now the next time I want to make something else, if I want to make erythropoietin, I don't have to start something completely new. 
It is not like I have a new strain of E. coli and then I have something else, some for new kind of fermenter and a new purification process. Everything is standardized. So the platform is I've, in a manufacturing facility or a manufacturing company. Everything is ready made. All I have to do, insulin change karna, erythropoietin dalna. Erythropoietin khatam ho gaya, fatty PCSK9 dalna. Ye khatam ho gaya. So that, everything else is called the platform. Right? It takes years to standardize the platform. Once you have a platform, then efficiency becomes very, very robust. Right? So that's why you need a platform. And then the commercial process is, the, is called the um, commercial process because when you start developing, let's say in, in this case again insulin, you have, you've expressed the insulin into the E. coli, the E. coli is secreting the insulin. Initially you're doing a lot of research experiments to see how much insulin can be produced, what are the culture conditions that can allow uh, the most insulin to be produced. You're trying different kinds of things, right? Once you validate the method that this is the method by which most optimal insulin is made, then you have what is a commercial method which is validated and that you can't change. Because that is what is getting approved by the FDA. The commercial process is getting approved by the FDA. The research process, the FDA, not that the research will, they, they don't care, but it is not important from a regulatory perspective. It is more, how did you derive, how did you come to the commercial process through understanding your research process? That is the commercial process. Yeah. So terms I have told you about are QBD, CQA, CPP. Now these are next few terms that I am telling you are very new in the field of, uh, e even in the field of process development, you will hear something called MAM, which is multi-attribute methods. So what happens is, in, uh, especially mass spec is used for this technology. What happens is sometimes when I, you, you, want to measure my, uh, you want to measure glycosylation of a protein, you want to measure isomerization of a protein, you want to measure deamidation de of a protein, you want to measure aggregates, you want to measure dimers, monomers, you want to measure all of these different functions. Typically what happens for each of the methods, each of the, each of the parameters, each of the critical quality attribute, you need to have a different method. I have a method for aggregates, I have a method for glycosylation. In the more recent technologies of uh, especially high-end mass spec, you do one method and it gives you everything, multi-attributes. But it's very difficult to validate because if, if, you have a met, if you have a single method, the method should be sensitive and specific to measure glycosylation and also aggregation. So, you know, th that it becomes a challenge to how to develop and validate this method, but it is very useful once it is developed. So, a lot of people are spending time on this multiple uh, attribute method. Um, and you, if you look at literature, this is the literature, this is the latest literature on process development. And PAT, process analytical tools. So, what is process analytical tools? There are two things that you have, when you, when you go to analytical sciences in a manufacturing facility, there are two types of analytical groups. From, even from a career perspective, there are two types of groups. One group is part of the process team. So the process team in the R&D process team, they're embedded within the process team. So, so there might be a process engineer who's running the, um, the huge uh, fermenter, right? They're, they're busy looking at the culture conditions and, and they're figuring out what the best conditions for the uh, fermenter is, right? While the fermenter is going on, you need to take samples from these, from the fermenter and be able to measure the level of protein that is being secreted or number of impurities that are being secreted or number of host proteins that are being secreted. You need to be measure all of those, right? These are called in-process measurements. So the process is going on, you're taking samples from the in-process and looking at in-process measurements, right? Versus the process is done, I've got absolutely pure material, Right at the end, and I want to make sure that the process that is that the analytical methods that are used for measuring the final product is also very precise and accurate. So that is a that is a different set of analytical tools that you need, and for the in process you need a different set of analytical tools. These are called in process analytics, and these are process analytical process analytical. They are measuring the process, and finally your release assays, process release assays. So those are the two different kind of analytical tools. And we talked about GMP, there's also GDP is good documentation practice. Yesterday we talked about good clinical trial practice, so all of that. Um, lots of terms. Some of these slides I'm not going to go into in detail. I'll just tell you overall of pub process development. I like to tell you about people, famous people who are working in this field or who have worked in this field. Uh, so Jim Thomas um, is sort of a legendary 
person in the field of process development. He's like god of process development, so to speak. So he's been working in this area for many, many years. He lives in Seattle. Now he's retired. He did his PhD at Purdue University. Uh, he did his postdoctoral fellowship at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT in Boston. And then for many years, he worked in many pharmaceutical companies uh, like Genentech, Immunex, and Amgen. Uh, and uh, he he's the one who's who's got a very deep understanding of all aspects of process development of biologics. So when he started his career, maybe 40 years ago or whatever, E. coli expression, that's genetic, the first recombinant protein that was ever made was, I think it was insulin or growth hormone, one of those two, I think it was insulin. What they, what they took was they took the gene for insulin and put it into E. coli and they expressed the protein. That was done in 1972. And before that, there was no pro concept of recombinant protein. So that's when it started. And, and Jim Thomas has been involved in the development of these proteins since then. So, you know, so he's been doing a lot of work in this area. Um, another person who is very important in the field of uh, process development is Anne Lee. Uh, she's the BM, she's vice president of BMS right now, executive vice president of BMS. She's now moved on to, and now she's working on cell and gene therapy now. She's working on uh, manufacturing cell and gene therapy. PhD from Yale, um, scientist, scientist and leader of process development of both vaccines and biologics at Genentech and Merck, uh, chemical engineering from Cornell University, um, and uh, member of the National Academy of Engineering, so was uh, Jim Thomas. So very, very famous people in the field, in this field. Organizational structure, we had already talked about organizational structure earlier. Specifically in the field of process development and manufacturing, uh, which is relevant to many of you who are, you're, you're, you're an IAT, so you're, you're learning how, how process development and things are manufactured, right, or and analyzed. Generally in the process development group, which will be in R&D, which will be in the R&D function within a pharmaceutical company, for, a, for process development you might have a cell engineering group who makes cells, there you will have molecular biologists, gene editors, and, and things like that who can make the cell lines then these cells have to be grown in large quantities. So you have upstream development. So you have fermentations and fermenters and growing the cells in large quantities. And then you have downstream, which is purification units like chromatography and ion, ion exchange, um, reverse phase, many different kinds of form, uh, purification. Then finally, formulation. Um, and then supporting all of these will be analytical groups. All of those groups will have analytical group in them. Now, once the process is developed and transferred to manufacturing, the manufacturing group has slightly different kind of organizational structure. Now, the process has been developed. You know what the upstream is, you know what the downstream is, you know what the analyticals are. What you have now are called drug substance and drug product. What is drug substance? You have the culture, you have the E. coli culture, you've grown it in a, you've grown the E. coli in a big uh, fermenter. Um, you, you lyse the cells or you take the um, exclusion bodies, you lyse them and you extract the protein out of that expression system. And now you've got a large amount of protein and a big volume, right? That volume can be reduced through filtration and reducing the volume. Now you've got what is called the bulk, right? You might have, you know, one kilogram or 10 kilograms of insulin in a vial or a, or a, or a container, 10 kilograms, right? This you can't inject into people. 10 kilograms, you can't inject into people, right? So this 10 kilogram insulin now has to be put into individual vials. And these individual, or we have to put into individual syringes or cartridges, because sometimes cartridge will go into a injection device and you just change the cartridge, right? So they have to go into vials, cartridges, or, or syringes. The, the, when insulin is present in these cartridges, it's called the drug product. So you have drug substance and you have drug product. Again, the kind of skill and the, and the career trajectory that you have, that the, the kind of training that you need to do is very different if you're a, if you're a drug substance engineer or, or an analytical person versus a drug product engineer. The kind of skills you need is very different. Because in drug, drug product, you need to, know, you need to manage small, millions of small volume things and in this, you need huge volumes of few things. So a lot of different kind of technologies are used 
for both kind of things. Right? So, drug, so in the manufacturing unit, you will have a department of drug substance, drug product, then you also have devices, you know, syringes and all of these, there will be different engineering for that. And then finally, what is that engineering thing over here on the top? When you have a manufacturing facility, you need a huge number of engineers to just manage the place because they have large structures, right? Huge structures of things, pipes and this and that. So you need a different scale to actually manage the manufacturing facility. So that's, these are the different departments and of course analytical. Uh, and that's how the difference between the um, job roles in R&D versus job roles in engineering looks like in manufacturing facilities, right? The analytics is the eyes, ears, nose and the mouth of the process and the product, right? You have to be able to measure the product very specifically. And there are a whole bunch of tests that you can do. I like this slide, it's a busy slide, but you will have all these slides in your, if, if you've downloaded them. When you, whenever you look at anal, analyzing anything, whether, whether it's a small molecule or a large molecule, you have to start with primary structure and all these tests can be done for primary structure. Then you do higher order structure, which Ashutosh's group does, and you'll see NMR is one of the things. But there are many, many different ways to look at higher order structure. Then you look for purity, and there are two, two kinds of impurities that you have. One is some impurity that might be present in the product, which is, you know, either, you know, it could be part of the, part of the material that you've not purified. And the other could be variants of the protein. So, for example, if you have, if you have insulin, and insulin is expressed in the gene, then you will have some insulin that may be isomerized and some may be not isomerized. So you, it's the same insulin, but it has different kind of variabilities. So there are product variants and there are impurities. And both have to be removed, right? Both have to be removed and that is the challenge in the manufacturing, uh, in the purification groups. And then finally you need people, you need the biological assay for all of this. So this is how you characterize, these are all the battery of tests that you need to do to characterize a single protein. And usually, you know, there'll be like two, three hundred scientists working in the analytical group only because you need specialized training to run any of these, any of these analytical tools. So just in, when you, again, looking for jobs in an industry, analytical science is probably a huge uh, area of uh, job requirements. And of course, cryo-EM is the latest in terms of higher order structure. Flow cytometry and imaging, lot of, lot of that is also there. This is a slide that scans the entire range of imaging technology that you can use. On the extreme, on, on the right side, on, on that side, on the everyday side, things that you can do every day are confocal microscopy, laser scanning microscopy and flow cytometry. And these other technologies like scanning EM, EM electron tomography and crystallography are not done every day. You, you have a product and you have specialized technologies to measure them. But this is the range of, anal, of imaging technologies that you can use. This is just more instrumentation that is used in imaging. Yeah. So let me just move forward. Uh, and this is about molecule assessment. I'll tell you a few examples uh, now. So when you take a monoclonal antibody, and yesterday we were talking about the mono, some monoclonal antibody that you were asking me about, which has a heavy chain and a light chain, right? So the heavy chain is this shown, thing shown in green. It has these CDR binding sites, which are shown in here in yellow. But look at the number of things that are, it's a huge molecule, right? 150 kilodalton molecule. And the specific sites on the immunoglobulin molecule that can be modified can be deamidation sites, oxidation sites, glycosylation sites, that the ends can be truncated. So all of these have to be measured through various technologies. Yeah? So again, this is another slide showing lots of post-translational modifications that, that all have to be measured through the molecule assessment process. Ravi talked about the risk assessment where you have to look at um, severity, likelihood and detection of, of risks. Uh, I'm not going to go through risk assessment. He's, we've already talked about it. This is the, these are the platform. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some pictures. Oh, by the way, this is the, this was not 1979. It was not 1972. It was 1979. This is the first paper in 1979 of insulin being expressed by E. coli. This is the historically a very important paper. This is on which Genentech got the patent for this, for this molecule. Yeah. Uh, this is what a bioreactor looks like. This is upstream and downstream development. But when you look at large manufacturing facilities, this is a bioreactor. This is a bioreactor in a manufacturing facility. It's a 50,000 liter bioreactor. 
and, and this is growing monoclonal antibodies, right? How big is a 50,000 liter bioreactor? It is three stories tall. It's huge. Three stories tall is just one bioreactor and it's growing monoclonal antibodies, massive. So, you can imagine the engineering that is required to manage this. All these tubes are putting media inside the cells, taking out media, you have sampling, a lot of things are happening. It's a closed unit, right? So, all of these things requires immense engineering uh, understanding. These are columns to purify the, the units. Uh, I told you about drug product, drug substance. Stability of a molecule has to be demonstrated um, during filing. Usually, it's a during filing, you need three months stability, but usually the more stable your molecule is, the better it is from a marketing perspective, right? So, and tablets are stable for a long time, but liquid like insulin and all will not be stable for a long time. So, then formulation is important. What are the kind of formulations that you need to stabilize these molecules for a long time? These are some devices, injection devices that are used for injecting drugs, uh, more uh, characterization. Then in the drug development process, in process development, there are two steps that you need to do from a regulatory perspective. One is called process characterization, which means like in the design space I told you, you have to understand all the factors that are important that can contribute to the variability of the drug, right? And then you have process validation where you have, you have to define the parameters, you have to define your li limits and you have to do three runs and all the three runs, all the parameters have to meet those criteria. These are, this is called process validation. Both these are required for approval of the drug. So, let me show you something else. In the process development and then this will be the manufacturing part and then, then we will move on to the gene therapies for a second. So, I like to show this slide. Um, so, this is, uh, I do not know if you can see it clearly, but this is Merck's manufacturing facility. 300 acres, about 50, 60 manufacturing buildings in this site. This is in near Philadelphia. This is outside of Philadelphia. It's huge. It's huge. Uh, these all your, all what I told you are you know, there'll be R and D labs, there'll be manufacturing labs, there'll be uh, process development labs. It's it's massive, right? This is one view. This is another another manufacturing facility. You can see how big these manufacturing facilities are. Right? This is um, this is actually Biocon. Uh, this is a Malaysia site of um, Biocon's Malaysia site. Biocon has a manufacturing facility in Malaysia. Um, I'll just keep showing you these facilities. This is Biocon in uh, um, Bangalore. This this tent-like thing is the cafeteria. Um, this is the R&D building for um, Biocon in Bangalore. And here, this this bottom glass door thing over here, that was my office for five years. Um, huge facility, even the R&D facility is huge. And this whole thing on the side over here next to the R&D facility is the drug substance, drug substance manufacturing facility where all the bioreactors and um, purification units are there. And next to that is the drug product facility where all the syringes and vials are made, right? So, you can see that the, it's the requirement of R&D and manufacturing facilities to be next to each other. It's physically also everybody is collaborating with each other. Now, this is the R&D facility. This is more bioreactor. People are working on the bioreactor over here. You can see that they are wearing all these gowns and you have to gown up and work in these places, right? And in, in more cleaner environments, you have to wear this whole Tyvek gown, complete gowning system in and out is in, uni, in one direction, all of that. So, just wires and tubings. This is what manufacturing facility, biologic manufacturing facilities look like. Right. This is again fermenters, you can see how big the fermenters are. Um, control units, um, it is almost like a you know operation theater that uh, all of these units are controlled through um, units that are, that are providing real time information about what is happening inside the bioreactor, inside the purification unit. So, this is what a this is what a manufacturing job might look like, right. Um, it is it's 24 hours because the, the, the run runs all, all night. Um, and just more pictures, this I showed you earlier. This is a unit, very interesting unit where after the vial has been made, um, there are people, this is, this is a physical examination of every vial that is made and you have to see that the vial does not have any particulate matter. And these people are trained just to look at the particulate matter, right. This is, this is actually done physically manually, some of the, some, some of it is done manually. 
now there's more automation to this technology but now but lot of it is still manual some some fraction of it is still manual because it might miss so this is what that a facility like that might look like this is a filling unit so you have you have the duct substance and this duct substance has to go into vials and you know the vials of insulin vials can be filled as much as like 1 million vials are, are filled every minute that's how that's how fast the vials are being filled and they have to be filled absolutely precisely so if an insulin vial has specifications of filling 1 ml of insulin into the vial it has to be 1 ml and the variance is allowed is 1.01 and 0.99 very very small variance is allowed if the if the variance is high the vials have to be thrown out because what happens is if you take insulin and the insulin has to be injected into a person 1 ml insulin has to be injected into a person and if there is more insulin then some bad thing will happen to the patient if you give more insulin so every insulin vial has to be absolutely accurate so a lot of technology goes into developing these processes right so that sort of the magnificence of manufacturing i call it um i've been talking about this uh, um, otc deficiency um uh, gene therapy otc is a liver enzyme and what otc does is when we eat protein prot in our in normal cells protein is taken it is converted to uh, urea that's oh, that's how our normal metabolism of a protein occurs right in the absence of or otc enzyme um when when these kids eat protein it cannot be converted into urea because they don't have this essential enzyme in the pathway and the metabolite that is intermediate metabolite that is secreted is ammonia ammonia is secreted and this ammonia travels to the brain and passes the blood brain barrier and causes tremendous brain injury and within the first year of life the children die of of brain disease of brain inflammation this is the disease this is a very rare disease so if you are born with an otc deficiency and you eat protein you will die of brain disease and all children die right so very very rare disease but the nice thing about otc deficiency is that it is a single gene defect meaning if you correct this gene the child will live right so you, where and and the beauty of this thing is that this gene is expressed in the liver so if you express the gene in the liver you should be able to correct the disease another important thing about the gene this gene is you don't need 100% of the liver to be expressing this gene even if you have 5 10% of the liver expressing this gene that's good enough you'll have to eat the, the child will have to control how much protein they eat but you can live a, you should be able to live a normal life right liver transplants have been successfully used to treat this disease but liver transplants are very difficult to do so the, it's not a obvious option right and uh, and another thing that in gene defects what happens is over expression of of a gene sometimes is also bad like if you give insulin if you give too much insulin that's also bad right in this case giving too much is not bad it it it's not considered toxic so all of these reasons otc deficiency seemed like a very good disease to test whether you can treat gene therapy so clinical trial third generation adenovirus vector expressing the otc otc gene which was being driven by a chicken beta actin promoter the vector was given intra portally in the portally meaning uh, you you give it through the vein that goes into the liver directly into the liver and dose escalating uh, you can see 2 times 10 to the 10th to 6 times 10 to the 11th particles are being given one quick thing about the immune response because this is this is what will manifest in this in this uh, story antigen is taken up by antigen presenting cells these antigen presenting cells activate t cells t cells will secrete interferon gamma or il4 and they will help b cells make antibodies or t cells differentiate into cytotoxic t cells this is basic 101 immunology right patient number 19 was jesse gelsinger this is a, he's a very famous patient you can google him there's a wikipedia page on him he died because of this vaccine because of this gene therapy and the field of gene therapy changed its course um, because of this death and this is a very landmark uh, trial this this patient had otc deficiency at the age of 30 months uh, he had a unique mutation in the otc deficiency and he had multiple symptoms of this hyperammonia based um, head um, brain injuries uh and he had various levels of urea uh, present in his uh, in his body so he met the acceptance criteria 
when he was given the given the adenovirus this was not the first patient this was the 19th patient in the clinical in the dose escalation clinical trial when he was given the adenovirus in 12 hours he got a fever back pain and frontal headache 18 hours he developed jaundice an altered mental status his liver functions were deteriorating rapidly in 48 hours he got a systemic immune response which is called disseminated intravascular coagulopathy basically it means that entire body starts getting inflammatory responses uh, in 88 hours he his liver and renal and, and, and kidney failed and in 98 hours which is almost five days later his life support was re removed and he died of the gene therapy giving the gene therapy so what happened why did he die and this is a huge study in the field of gene therapy a lot of uh, clinical parameters uh, lab safety parameters were deteriorating uh, his post-mortem showed that his bone marrow was involved and a lot of things would happen just as expected from the uh, from a surgery what happened was he got this massive cytokine storm cytokine storm and this was in 1990s Cyto nothing was known about cytokine storm today with covid we know about cytokine storm with car t cells we know about cytokine storm and we know how to control it right this is the first time cytokine storm like syndrome happened with gene therapy and this patient died because of that and the cytokine storm was primarily because of TNF alpha and, and IL-6 uh, which was massively secreted in this patient and caused this massive inflammation through which the patient died and this was totally unexpected uh, and this is you know you can see that in the dose escalation study all the patients uh, are inducing cytokine responses up to patient 18 and patient 19 has this massive response one of the classic features of adenovirus or give or any drug given to a liver is that it, it has this toxicity which is called the elbow effect elbow effect meaning you know it has elbow effect so you can see at the bottom that up to patient 17 it's a dose escalation study you're giving 2 to the 9th 6 to the 9th uh, 2 times 10 to the 10th 6 times 10 to the 10th it's dose increasing right but no toxicity till you see 2 times 10 to the 11th 6 times 10 to the 11th was suddenly huge toxicity so why is it that this happens this happens because of a particular kind of structure of the liver what the liver has is it has these macrophage like cells called Kupfer cells you probably heard of these right Kupfer cells are the macrophage population of the micro of, of the liver their job is whenever foreign things comes into the liver the, it's it works like a sieve chalni jaisa. it works like a sieve right and all the virus in this case would have been trapped by the at the low dose all the virus would have been trapped by the um, kupfer cells right but if the dose is higher now this virus which cannot be trapped by the kupfer cells now goes into systemic circulation right and why did this happen to this patient there are many reasons one of the reasons that a lot of studies later on showed is that this patient because this patient already has a liver disease right it, it, it has a defective liver to begin with there's a lot of fibrotic liver so this liver was very defective to begin with um, so the tolerance of the high dose in this patient was lower and once the virus or the vector started going systemic then the systemic inflammatory response occurred so this is a story of how um, you know all of these Im immune responses to viral vectors uh, are so important in studying I won't go through the details of how the animal studies were done to discover this uh, this biology so um, this is this is a very important study in the field of gene therapy and so that's why the, the in the course of gene therapy looking at inflammatory response to viral vectors has been central to um, how viral vector you know today we're using adeno associated viral vectors we're doing lentiviral vectors inflammation is the first thing people look for and the reason for that is this study so the landmark study for toxicology and clinical trials for, for not just for gene therapy but just for all therapies yeah. so that's sort of the toxicology story